This chapter will cover the basics of creating plots in R. It will begin by demonstrating the plotting capabilities available in R out of the box. These capabilities are often re referred to as base R. In the resources section of the book, you can also find resources to learn more about ggplot2, which is one of the most common plotting libraries in R. Now that you've learned how to create a linear regression model, let's look at how you might go about representing it visually. So let's use the faithful data set. And let's begin by just creating a basic scatter plot of the raw data. Additionally, you can alter the appearance of all these points. So now they're just empty circles. Uh, but we can adjust that by using the PCH and CEX and COL options. PCH stands for plot character and will adjust the symbol used for your points. The available point shapes can be found with this function. So yeah, what we're using now looks like this, where it's just an empty circle. Um, the CEX option allows you to adjust the symbol size. The default value is one. But if you were to change the value to 0.75, for example, the plot symbol would be scaled down to three fourths of the default size. And then the COL option allows you to adjust the color of your plot symbols. So let's try adding these options in. Okay, so we've got all three of those. And let's see what the plot looks like. Now we compare it to this. Um, yeah, so our color is a little bit different. Instead of an empty circle, it's filled. And then the size is a little bit different as well. Um, you can also adjust the axes with xlab, ylab, xaxt, and yaxt options. Um, along with some other options, but we're not going to cover those. Uh, in the next example, let's go ahead and remove the axes altogether. Now let's see what that looks like. Okay, so that's what we had before. That's what we have now. Finally, you can add a trend line by creating a model and adding the fitted values to the graph. We can also adjust the line width and color with the LWD and COL parameters respectively. Okay, so in order, let's go ahead and move this out of our way. Okay, now to create a model, say uh, there's a variable named model it's equal to L, the LM function of faithful eruptions being a function of faithful waiting. We'll create that. And then we'll use the AB line function and pass in the model we just created. Use the call parameter to adjust the color of the line and then also adjust the line width. Okay, and let's go ahead and add that. Okay, so we'll see that added our trend line to the graph. Um, and that trend line is a representation of this linear model that we just created. So that model that we created also contains confidence intervals for the predictions, which can be added to our plot. So I've got an example over here. Instead of DFX, we'll use faithful waiting. Oh, gotta run this again. So now we have our confidence interval stored in this variable called confidence interval. Next, to add those confidence intervals, what we need to do is use the lines function. 
we'll pass in the x variable. Looks like I'm frozen here. Let's see. But yeah, we'll use the lines function, pass in the x variable, specify the data from that confidence interval variable that we have. And then we're also going to use the col, col parameter and the LTY parameter to color the confidence interval lines we're going to add to the plot. And the LTY parameter is going to specify the line types. Um, okay, I'm unfrozen now. So we'll say lines. And then we'll use our x value. And we'll say conf interval. We're going to index in and grab that value. We're going to say the line color is going to be equal to blue. And then the line type is going to be the second line type. And then we're going to add in another line for the other bound of the confidence interval. Say faithful waiting conf interval. But this time we're going to use the third value. We'll give it a blue color and say the line type is equal to two. All right, let's run that and see if it works. Okay, so it looks like we've got confidence or intervals added onto our graph. All right, let's clear this out and go through a couple other options we have in base R for plotting. That last example was built just using a scatter plot, but we've got some other options here. Um, one you've already seen in the outliers chapter is the box plot. These plots can be created with the box plot function. So that's simple. We can build on this plot though by specifying the data set with the data parameter, removing the empty cars dollar sign prefix from our variable, adding a plot title with the main parameter, and adding axis labels with the xlab and ylab parameters. Additionally, we're going to add an additional additional variable for our data data to be categorized by. So I've got an example that we can use. So you see, we're not using prefixes anymore. We're passing in the data here with the data parameter. And then we've got some other things. Let's just run to see how those look. So our main parameter ends up being our title. So our, our main label. And then our X lab or our X label is number of forward gears. And we see that comes down here. And then Y lab is miles per gallon which we see here. And then we also passed in a, another variable so that we get a little bit of a more complex box plot. Um, we can also set the box colors with the COL parameter and set notch equal to true to give our, box, our boxes notches. Um, yeah, I've got an example here. Let's run that Let's see what that looks like so we said box plot and then passed in mpg and am our data parameter is empty cars again we use this notch parameter to say true and then uh we gave each of the box plots their colors so we got blue and then gray our main label is car mileage by in engine x label is automatic and then Y labels miles per gallon. Um, the notches of the two plots, if they don't overlap, then um, chambers and two key, uh, I'll give this, let me paste this reference in here. And this resource, let's make this a little bigger so you can see that. Um, they've suggested that this means there's strong evidence that the two medians differ. So if these notches aren't overlapping each other, that's strong evidence that those medians are not the same 
within like statistic statistical boundaries. Okay, next we have a plot matrix, and we can use the pairs function to create a plot matrix. And let's use the iris data set to demonstrate that. I want to go ahead and get rid of this reference. Okay, make that a little bigger. Um, this plot gives us the ability to see how each variable interacts with one another. So, for example, we've got sepal length and sepal width and how they interact with each other here, sepal length and petal length, how they interact here, and so on. All right, next is the infamous pie chart. Let's try plotting a pie chart of the species in the iris data set. We can use the pie function to do that. And the function accepts numerical values. So we'll need to use the table function on our column as well. So this is what we're going to end up doing. But let's just run this table function as a refresher for what that does. So that is giving us each distinct species in the species column, as well as the number of times each species occur. So let's run that pi function. Now we have a pie chart of all three of those species and they are equal to each other because they each occur 50 times. Um, you can view a full list of available parameters for this and other functions through the help tab in the files, tame, files pane of RStudio. So this bottom right pane is the files pane. Go to the help tab and let's type in pi. And we can see all of the options that are available with this function. So there's a few things you could do here. And then this tip goes for any function. If you ever need help with something, um, start with this help tab and it'll, it might get you headed in the right direction. All right, let's go back to our plots. And let's do a bar plot of those species. So we're going to use table, the table function again on species to do a bar plot. And all the bars are the exact same height, kind of a boring chart, but gets the point across. And then we've also used this next one um, in the outliers chapter to visually identify extreme values. And that's the histogram. But here is a recap. So the histogram will show you how many occurrences of an observation in a bucket or a range of values. So between 25 and 30, for example, there were two observations and so on for all the other buckets. And then we also did a density plot in the outliers chapter, and it's similar to the histogram, if you remember. So this will kind of give you like a smooth view of the distribution of observations. Uh, pretty similar to what the histogram does, but it's not putting them into buckets. With the density plot, we can take it another step further by adding a title and a shape to the plot. So this is kind of fun. We'll say MPG is equal to a density plot of empty cars, and more specifically, the MPG column. And then we're going to plot MPG and give it a main label of MPG distributions. So we don't want this up here. That's kind of confusing. Okay. So not much has changed so far. But then we can add a shape to this by using the polygon function and saying MPG is the values. The color is light blue and the border is black. And now it gives us a shape that's equal to the density plot. All right, our last example of base R plots is the dot chart. So let's clear everything out and start fresh. And we're going to go through this one a little more in depth and start with a new data set. Um, so we're going to say we have a list of people that are salespeople, and we're going to save that list of people in a variable 
called salesperson. And then we have a corresponding, uh, or I shouldn't say list, I should say vector, but you get the idea. We have a corresponding character vector of what product all of those salespeople are selling. And then we're gonna say, how many sales do they each have with a numeric vector? And let's use all three of those vectors to create a data frame. Let's go ahead and run that. And let's print the data frame. See what that looks like. Alternatively, you can click on it and kind of view things here. All right. Now let's just do a basic dot chart and see what that looks like. Okay, so this just gives us a pretty simple dot chart of all of the sales for these for these salespeople. It's kind of hard to read right now, so let's keep going. Let's start by adding labels and say the labels are equal to all the salespeople. And let's see what those labels look like. So that's that's starting to get a little bit easier to read. So if we come to Trevor, that's me, we can see that I have, it looks like I've sold 16 or 17 so far. Let's go over and see if that's right. And yeah, that looks like what it's saying, but it's still a little hard to read, so let's keep going. Uh, let's start by adding groups. So let's group all these salespeople by what product they're selling. So we'll start by using the as.factor on the product column and save that into a variable called groups. And then we're going to do the same thing as we did before, but we're going to pass in groups using the groups parameter. And now things are a little more nuanced. We have all the salespeople here, but they're grouped into their respective products that they're selling. Um, we can take that another step further by giving each of the groups their own color. So let's try that, which is great. It basically just gave the labels of the products, the colors, uh, but nothing too crazy there. Let's go ahead and give all the salespeople and their dots colors that match the products they're selling. Let's run that. Okay, that's a little better. Um, so now we can see we've got three groups of salespeople by their respective products that they're selling and all their dots are associated with their groups by color. And we can kind of take a quick visual look and see how each salesperson is selling compared to both their peers inside their product group, but also the, the overall organization. Okay, that's all the plots we're going to cover in base R, but uh, if you're working in R, you're likely going to move on to ggplot at some point if you want to start doing more advanced visual things. We're not going to go through ggplot in depth in this course just because there's resources that do that much better than I could, but I will point you towards those resources. So first is just like the ggplot2 documentation you can go to ggplot2.tidyverse.org. If you just want a quick cheat sheet for ggplot2, you can go to this link. And these links are available in the book, chapter 17, at the very end, it's 17.3. Um, the ggplot2 extension gallery is a cool place to go to see what other people are doing with ggplot2. And then um, this R colors is a good resource as well.